in going through this overview, I'm going to spend a lot of time on the multilingual perspective, which I'll explain. We're going to get into some sample instruction and then really important for um, implementing teaching for biliteracy, our systems and structures. And then I'm going to briefly share our plan for 2021-2022 and get into some questions and answers. So the first thing I want to do is have you look at our logo. This is the logo for the Center for Teaching for Biliteracy. And it represents a fully developed bilingual. We use colors to represent languages. Green in this example and throughout today's presentation will represent Spanish. Blue represents English. And this beautiful Mediterranean teal represents the gift of being bilingual. And that is the mixture of Spanish, of green and blue together, and the ability to use your languages together to transfer what is learned from one language to the other and to develop metalinguistic awareness, which means knowing how your two languages are similar and different. And we call this third linguistic space the bridge. So we have three linguistic spaces, Spanish, English, and the bridge. And a fully developed bilingual, who is not, by the way, a kindergartner, nor even a fifth grader, right? It takes a long time to become a fully developed bilingual. But that fully developed bilingual should be able to operate in Spanish, using informal, light colors of green, and formal, dark colors of green, Spanish, or discourses. English, again, informal and formal discourses. And to know um, when and how to operate in that third space, the, link, the, the bridge. And the, the ability to use informal and formal discourses of the language means that we need to protect the languages. We need to have protected space and time for Spanish, protected space and time for English, and this third space requires its own time. So already we're looking very different from a monolingual system. Um, so the question is, how do we be support students in, become, in becoming fully developed bilinguals? And that's the presentation I'm going to be sharing with you today. So here's the goal of teaching for biliteracy. Students who, who are bilingual and biliterate, so Spanish and English, but also who can leverage their cross-linguistic skills um, or Spanish and English. And overlaying all of this is developing sociocultural competence, the ability to really know oneself as a cultural person and integrate and work with others um, with, from other um, different perspectives. This goal, our goal, matches the goal that comes from the Guiding Principles for Dual Language or from the Center for Applied Linguistics and other national um, organizations in our country. I'm sure you're very familiar with this. I'm gonna go ahead and let you just look at this for a minute. So, so a few, um, uh, highlights from this goal. It, we're not just talking about speaking, listening, reading and writing only. We're also talking about grade level academic achievement in two languages and that sociocultural competence for all. This is a really um, robust and lofty goal which we can definitely achieve, but it matters how we organize ourselves. And this goal matches the vision of a number of programs. So students in two-way immersion, one-way dual language, dual language developmental bilingual, late exit transitional bilingual, 80-20, 50-50, two teacher model, one teacher model. We work across the country and we work with um, just programs that have lots of different configurations. But for the ones I've just um, listed here, the goal would be the same. What's the difference? The difference would be percentage of time. The difference might be how if you have a one teacher model, one teacher who does both languages, or a two teacher model, one's a Spanish teacher, one's an English teacher. And then of course, the students. So the students in a two way language immersion program come from a variety of linguistic backgrounds, whereas the students in a developmental bilingual late exit transitional bilingual or one way dual language come from similar linguistic backgrounds. And so I'm going to take you into the multilingual perspective. Um, this multilingual perspective, um, it's actually the first chapter of our book, if you have a copy of our book. 
And it really shows how the field has evolved and changed since the 70s and 80s when bilingual and dual language programs started. And part, to, part of the multilingual perspective is the idea that we want to foster this bilingual identity. And so I'm going to start by really describing who our students are so that we can think of the different paths that exist. So in the United States, we have some students that are sequential bilinguals. And if you think of my color coding and you see what I just put up here, these are blue students, everything they know, they know in English, and they're going to become bilingual by becoming fully developed. So everybody do this with me, sequential bilingual. So they know one language, they add on a second, and then they become fully developed bilinguals. So some sequential bilinguals are blue, other sequential bilinguals are green. What does that mean? It means that they only know Spanish, they're going to add on English, and they're going to become fully developed. So two kinds of sequential bilinguals. Um, these are monolingual students who become bilingual. And typically, your green students are not born in the United States. They are your students who come from Honduras or, or Argentina or Mexico, and they know that one language and are becoming bilingual into the second. The other path to this bilingual identity and bilingualism are students that are um, simultaneous bilinguals. And so simultaneous bilinguals, if you do this with me, this TPR, they are always exposed to two languages. And this means that they present differently. Look at what they look like. They're already teal or green and blue. They are simultaneous bilinguals, but the goal is the same. They're going to become bilingual, biliterate, and bicultural. And so the key to our students would be this image here. And I'm going to be speaking about all of these students in a minute. Um, but we have green, blue, teal, and orange students. Our orange students are those who come in with a third language. So here in Chicago, that would be Polish speakers, Arabic speakers, Tagalog speakers, Mandarin speakers. I'm sure it's very similar in Maryland, if not more diverse. Um, and the question is, can they all be in the dual language program? And the answer is yes. Um, a little thing about simultaneous bilinguals that we've learned to say is being simultaneous bilingual does not mean that you automatically have in Spanish the same knowledge experiences in language as what you have in English. Um, balance, simultaneous bilinguals don't necessarily mean that they are balanced bilinguals. And so you're starting to realize that this is a challenge, right? And a very good one. They know some things in Spanish and different things in English. We then have to really get to know students across their two languages. So what does the monolingual and multilingual perspective mean? So I'm juxtaposing these two perspectives. Um, and many of us were trained to think of language programs using the monolingual perspective, the um, example on the left. And this um, first example that I'm gonna share with you establishes the fact that all students have a dominant language, an L1 and an L2. And this comes from the research on sequential bilinguals, which is the research we used when we started our language programs in the United States. And for the students who are sequential bilinguals, this works really, really well. But the question is, where do simultaneous bilinguals be, um, fit? And that's where the field is changing. We know that simultaneous bilinguals are different. And to ex um, give you an example of this particular statement, I'm going to share an anecdote about, about myself. So I was born in Mexico City to Doug and Peg Beeman. And I'm very proud of my Mexican background, and I was lucky to live there through high school. Um, clearly, I'm a simultaneous bilingual. Every day, I was exposed to Spanish and to English, and I was really lucky. And we would um, visit grandma in Boston, um, not very often, but when we could. When I was little, according to my mom, um, I was interacting with my cousins, who I love very much, and their mother said to my mother, Hey, Peg, aren't you worried about Karen's English? She knows less words in English than her cousins. And my mom, who's very wise and an educator, didn't miss a beat. And she said, well, you've only heard what she can say in English. She, she knows as many words in Spanish 
but they're all different. When you add what Karen can do in English and Spanish together, she actually has more language than her monolingual cousins. So my aunt was coming from the monolingual perspective. My mother pushed the conversation to the multilingual perspective. And I'm going to suggest to you that you have to do the same. Whether you start as a sequential bilingual or a simultaneous bilingual, you're going to, our, our students are going to look different. And if we embrace the multilingual perspective, we're going to be much more successful because we accept who they are and we build on it. So this perspective really matters. It matters because it dictates how we interact with students, how we place or accept students into our program, how we challenge students and move them to the next level and how we treat them. And so the idea of first lang bilingual first language has really taken hold in our field. And it's important for us as practitioners to really understand it especially when we talk about the number of students in our country who are English learners who are born in the United States. So in the United States, we now have 82% of students K-5 born in the United States. These students are sequen uh, simultaneous bilinguals. This wasn't the case in the 70s, 80s and early 90s. That's when we still had a lot of sequential bilinguals coming into the United States. And so there are lots of implications to this. Um, and the question, what is the L1 of the simultaneous bilinguals? It, we know the answer, I just gave it to you. It's bilingual first language. But if we're gonna embrace the multilingual perspective, that means we're gonna have to really reflect on the systems and structures we have in place. Example, an intake form. If the intake form says, what is the L1 of the student? that might not work with your simultaneous bilinguals. And so we might wanna look at a number of these um, systems and structures that we, that we have. Sequential bilinguals will enter um, as green or blue or orange, um, and then we'll have simultaneous bilinguals. And while this is how they start in the program, they all become developing bilinguals. And look at this, nobody is only one shade of color. They're all a mixture of colors. And that's really important for our mindset and that we follow that mindset into our work. So the second example I'm going to explore with you where we juxtapose monolingual and multilingual perspective is this idea of how students speak. So when students say wonderful things like this first grader who wanted to tell me he was stuck, but he said to me, maestra, estoy estoqueado. What he um, did was he used his Spanish, couldn't figure out how you say stuck in English. So he used stuck and conjugated it perfectly well a la Spanish, right? The monolingual perspective, unfortunately, would look for a monolingual utterance of Spanish and then would say, oh, low language, confused, maybe shouldn't even be in a dual language or TWE program. Whereas the multilingual perspective says, this is what developing bilinguals do. They're going to use their two languages together. This is predictable and this is the key, we should embrace it. And what does that mean? It means that students are gonna do wonderful things like this. Se me mojaron mis soquetines. Ella me puchó. Teacher, I am planching. So these are developing bilinguals using all they know. Um, some of you might think, or I've, I've heard the term that they are translanguaging, and we can use that term as well. They are using all that they know when they speak. And so we need to understand their utterances, accept them, and build on them in, and move them into those three linguistic spaces, which is the goal of our program. And part of moving them to um, that understanding is this statement. So we cannot expect our students in the United States to speak like monolingual Spanish speakers, nor monolingual English speakers. That's not gonna happen. They're no longer all green or all blue or all orange. They are a combination of these colors. And so what do we do? One of the things we do is we take these utterances and we unpack them. And the chart that we would use is a chart that says, tambien se dice 
in Spanish class. In English, that would mean it is also said this way. And so instead of looking at students as low in both languages, which comes from the monolingual perspective, we want to use a multilingual perspective and convey también se dice. So we never reject, we always accept what students say, but we um, use it. And frankly, this is really, really um, successful to use puchar on the playground. But if I'm in my push and pull uh, unit in Spanish, I'm going to use empujar y jalar, right? So we're helping students really operate in these three linguistic spaces. And instruction needs to reflect how developing bilinguals use language, not how monolinguals use language. And so we're going to keep adding <clears throat> more and more examples to this también se dice chart as um, the year progresses. And when we do that, this is the kind of writing we're going to get. As a first grader, St. Charles, Illinois, my grandma likes to coser suéteres from my chihuahua. What a cute um, utterance in the writing process time, right? And so you can just imagine this little boy sitting with his abuelita and um, doing exactly that, helping her knit sweaters for their chihuahua. You might also have students who write like this. La hoja verde. What are they doing? Well, this is a dual language first grader from John Adams School in Alexandria, Virginia, and this student is using his English. Um, so hospital, right? That's how the H is in English. Well, that's not the case in Spanish. It's the H muda, but we're not surprised. Instead of saying, oh, this student doesn't know Spanish, we say, all right, we need to do some um, metalinguistic um, information and unpacking here. And so we would go in and talk about the juxtaposition of these letters so that we remember um, how the from English sounds in Spanish and where it's um, silent or mute and where it isn't. Another Example we love comes from Wisconsin. This was a student who's writing in Spanish and is writing about the farmeros, of which there are many in Wisconsin, right? And so this student is using her linguistic resources. Her name is Guadalupe. And instead of saying, no, así no se dice, what we say is, muy bien, y te voy a mostrar otra manera de decirlo. Right, and so el farmero is unpacked into the farmer, el granjero, and then we keep adding more and more and more examples. So developing bilinguals use all their resources and in their linguistic repertoires, and we expect them to make these approximations in part because look at the community in which they live. This is Colorado. And this is Palmetto, Florida. You kind of have to be bilingual to read this. Monica's bridal and quince, right? So our students see the signage all around them. Therefore, their language is bilingual. We know that students, the natural developing um, nature of students is to translanguage and to use the two languages together. We look at that as an asset. This third example is juxtaposing literacy instruction. So under the monolingual perspective, when students have an L1 and then they add an L2, we, do, we used to do the same thing with literacy instruction. Let's teach them to read in one language and then add a second. That's called sequential literacy. That doesn't work for a lot of our students, and I'll get into that a little bit with you, but you can already understand why, especially for those simultaneous bilinguals who already come in with linguistic resources in both languages languages. And so the multilingual perspective counters and says, let's start daily, and this is key, daily in kindergarten with two languages, not necessarily the same percentage. I believe in your, your district, you're 50-50, but there are 80-20 programs. The key is daily students are starting to see their two languages. And when they do that, they realize like that the pa 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 the Papa for father, the P for father, is the same as a P -p 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 for pizza. And they're going to start much more early at transferring their skills over and developing their biliteracy um, abilities. And so sequential literacy instruction 
only addresses the needs of sequential bilinguals, whereas simultaneous literacy instruction addresses the needs of a much broader um, group of students. Plus, it reflects the most recent research that we have in biliteracy, which is that students can learn to write at the same time in two languages without getting confused. However, we as the educators have to set the stage for that to be successful. So I'm going to show you some of those things we need to do. The first is to use something like the biliteracy unit framework to organize instruction. This comes from our book, Teaching for Biliteracy. Notice that this framework is standards based. We don't start with our materials or published um, programs. We start with the standards. And the reason is we wanna look across the two languages at how the students are experiencing, um, especially Common Core um, language art standards. Um, the other thing is we start by building oracy and background knowledge, which is very, very important. Um, if you can lift four fingers up, I want to explore this with you. Listening, speaking, reading, and writing. The academic listening and speaking is oracy, and students need strong oracy to be successful at reading and writing, which is literacy. But oracy building takes time. And we have to take the time to do it, because if we don't, our students will not be successful at literacy. Most published programs you purchase do very little oracy building, if any at all, and they start with literacy. And so this means we have to do something prior to literacy that prepares students for success. And I'm talking about green, teal, and blue and orange students together, and that is to build oracy and background knowledge. I'd also like you to notice that we have reading, writing, and word study as what literacy is, and we teach them in balance, and we integrate them. And so something we would never do is reading in Spanish and writing in English. We would always do reading, writing, and word study in Spanish, reading, writing, and word study in English daily. Not necessarily the same amount of time, but daily. And then the third thing I want you to notice here is content. We integrate content with literacy. And finally, we do the bridge. The bridge is for transfer and for contrastive analysis. So I'm going to become your teacher. I'm gonna put on my magic scarf and I'm gonna be in Spanish. Um, we strongly believe in protecting Spanish time. And so I'm gonna do that by modeling for you that the teacher stays in Spanish. But I'm gonna accept all of your linguistic approximations and your linguistic creativity. I know that my developing bilingual students are going to use everything they, they know. If over time my students continue to use a lot of English during Spanish time, I need to go back to my can-do statements from WIDA and really look at their language proficiency levels and really reflect on my instruction. Often when students use a lot of English during Spanish time over time, after I've started them off and we have our routines established, etc., it means that I'm not providing enough language scaffolding, visual, graphic, and interactive supports, and that I'm not integrating content with language and literacy enough. Teaching for biliteracy means always teaching language, literacy, and content. So I'm going to put on my scarf and do a very short example of what building oracy and background knowledge might look like and how it leads to literacy instruction. Muy bien. Ustedes lo que van a hacer ahorita es observar, ¿ok? Quiero que observen lo que voy a presentarles en la pantalla y que observen los movimientos que yo voy a estar haciendo. Quiero que escuchen, pero no quiero que hablen hasta que yo les diga. ¿Ok? ¿Sale, vale? Decimos en México. Primero vamos a ver ciclo. Vamos a ver el ciclo de vida de la mariposa. La mariposa pone huevos en la planta. Hagan esto conmigo. La mariposa pone huevos en la planta y lo ven en la imagen. Los huevitos amarillos, la mariposa monarca los pone de abajito de la hoja. La mariposa pone huevos en la planta. La oruga 
sale del huevo. A ver, háganlo conmigo. La oruga sale del huevo. La mariposa pone sus huevos en la planta. La oruga sale del huevo. La oruga come. Y de tanto comer, crece y crece y crece y crece. Crece mucho. Vamos a ver el ciclo. La mariposa pone sus huevos en la planta. La oruga sale del huevo. La oruga come. Y de tanto comer, crece, y crece, y crece. Luego, la oruga se convierte en crisálida. Nace una mariposa. ¿Y luego qué pasa? ¡Oh! La mariposa pone huevos en la planta. Es un ciclo. A ver, voy a pedir que um, Tamara... Y Norma, pongan sus micrófonos encendidos, por favor. Y, ah, perdón, <ríe> micrófono encendido. Y que me ayuden a hacer esto juntas. Y si hay otras personas que gustan acompañarnos, adelante. Empecemos con el ciclo. El ciclo. Ciclo. Muy bien. Ciclo de vida de la mariposa. La mariposa pone los huevos en la planta. Excelente. La oruga. La oruga sale del huevo. Muy bien. La oruga, la oruga come. Muy bien. La oruga crece. crece. Y crece. crece. Y cre crece. Y crece. Y crece. Crece. Muy bien. La oruga se convierte en crisálida. Excelente. Nace una mariposa. Mariposa. Excelente. Es un ciclo. Muy bien. Ahora, ayúdenme a leer. ¿Qué dice? La mariposa. Mariposa. Como todos los seres vivos, la mariposa tiene un ciclo de vida. Las mariposas ponen sus huevos en las plantas. Un super aplauso a mis alumnos. Muy, muy bien. Okay, that was just the tiniest little bit of showing you how we build oracy remotely. Obviously in person, we would be all standing up and doing the, um, the movements, but a very similar approach. And the reason we take our time to integrate language, literacy, and content is that that's what language learners need, number one. And number two, they really need oracy building as a precursor for literacy. So what I have done here with you would take a much longer time and um, we would actually, our literacy at first would be reading what we had said out loud. And the reason I don't give adults the words at the beginning is that children don't have the literacy level of adults. And I wanted you to really experience how children learn language. And that is that they first have to integrate it receptively to then produce it and then to go to the reading and the writing. So I used the biliteracy unit framework. This is a Spanish unit. You know that because it's green. If I were teaching in English, it would be exactly the same kind of instruction. It would be on totally different content, but it would be the same kind of framework. So we really want teachers to understand that the instruction is the same across program languages. So
So continuing with this juxtaposition of monolingual and multilingual perspective, we get to the really hard part. And the, the reason that um, it's so wonderful to work with district leaders and school leaders, because these are the things, the systems and structures that either hinder biliteracy development or really support them. Under the monolingual perspective, when we really thought of um, one language then the other in thinking of sequ the sequential bilingual um, research, we developed monolingual systems. Teach this in Spanish, everybody else is teaching the same thing in English. We want to keep you on the same biliteracy, um, sorry, the same monoliteracy schedule. Try to mirror the gen ed program. What we have found is that that actually hinders biliteracy development. And so instead, what we really want to make sure we do is create bilingual curriculum maps that are standard, standards based, bilingual units using a framework like the biliteracy unit framework that includes the bridge that's key for transfer and metalinguistic awareness, biliteracy schedules, and real important because assessment is a mirror of instruction, we need to have authentic assessments in both Spanish and English. So I'm going to share with you our guidelines. These help implement what I just said. Um, and we've learned the hard way across the country that these guidelines, while maybe new to some districts, really make a difference in helping students develop by literacy. The first is that on a daily basis, not every week, not every other day, but every day, we want students to be engaged in language arts in both languages, focusing on different um, standards and not the same theme standards or stories. And the reason this is important is that if we do the same thing in both languages, it becomes redundant and students just turn off the language that's harder for them. Plus, we don't have enough time. Doing standards-based instruction in two languages in the same amount of time as everybody does it in one language means that we're going to have to do something different. And so we really need to optimize our time. The second is we never have blue kids go out to learn English literacy and Span um, um, green kids go out to learn Spanish literacy. Where would your teal colored kids go, right? So instead we keep kids together, we help them leverage their bilingualism to um, help each other, and we differentiate. So a lot of training for teachers on differentiation and language scaffolding. We integrate content and literacy, which has been a hallmark of dual language for years. And then finally, this is really important. We teach content and by this science, social science and math in only one language all year long. We do not teach it in both. And there are some really good reasons for it. Um, the first reason is bilinguals only learn things once in terms of science, social studies or social science and math. Um, we want to reduce redundancy and we want to optimize transfer. And so what do we do? We, the first thing we do is we develop a language and content allocation plan that reflects these guidelines. And we realize that this plan determines our schedules, our curriculum units and our materials. And so um, the content allocation plan will have determined that language arts is taught in both languages daily, math in one, science in one, social studies in one, and we're going to um, integrate language arts with science and language arts with social studies. I wanna show you in a 50-50 model, which is the one that this, your district uses, what this would look like. So 50% of the day is in Spanish, 50% of the day is in English. This is one example. We have several, I'm gonna share two with you. Um, this is one we see a lot. <clears throat> science is in Spanish K-5, obviously integrated with language arts. There is a bridge at the end of every unit. Districts who have used this model have found that the dual language kids often even outperform monolingual English students in the science high stakes test in English because of the bridge. Um, science shares a lot of academic language between Spanish and English, and so students do really well transferring at the end of every unit what they've learned, they extend it, and then they have in English the academic language for what they learned in Spanish. 
This another consideration here is keeping social studies in English K-5. And the reason is most of our social studies life, our civics life especially is lived in English. And we don't want bilingual teachers spending a lot of time translating materials into Spanish. So instead we keep it in English. And in this example, math is in English. Another example would be this one where we chunk K-1-2 language arts integrated with social studies in Spanish and math is taught in Spanish, whereas language arts and science is taught in English and then they flip, they go to the opposite language, three, five. A lot of districts we work with like this idea of chunking. And so as you see, your language and content allocation plan can be very, verse, very different, but it has to be yours. It has to respond to your plan. But the most important thing is that you have one that it be made at the programmatic level, it be made based on what your students need, and that teachers follow it. So if you think of the language and content allocation plan determining the schedules, let's just play with this one. Take a look at this schedule and just think to yourself, what is the language and content allocation plan? So I think you figured out that it's 80% of the day is in Spanish. Language arts is integrated with science for one unit followed by social studies the next. It goes alternating. They teach math in Spanish, Spanish language development in Spanish. Whereas in English, it is language arts and English language development. Here's a 50-50 schedule, same question. So a different language and content allocation plan where we have Spanish language arts integrated with science and Spanish language development, whereas in English we have math and language arts integrated with social studies. And then this language and content allocation plan is also going to determine your by literacy curriculum units. You obviously have to have the plan first and your schedules first. Then you get into writing by literacy, standards-based by literacy maps and units. And we have a three step process. I'm gonna give you some examples in a minute. We typically find that step one, which is creating the standards based by literacy map and auditing it for rigor and balance is done across a district. Step two, which is writing units and assessment packets is also done across the, the district that allows for networking, for sharing of resources, etc. And then finally, the day-to-day -day by literacy plan or learning plan is typically loose because students are different and teachers are different. And so they will um, apply in their day-to-day -day plan steps one and two, but in a way where there is some versatility and some flexibility. So here are the, the three steps, the map, the booth triangle, we call it the triangle because it is standards, big ideas, outcomes that all come together with formative and summative assessment and then the learning plan. So I have some artifacts to share with you. This is what a standards-based map would look like. This comes from the state of Washington where they teach um, in this particular example in fourth grade. I'm sorry, this comes from the state of California where um, in fourth grade they're teaching social studies in Spanish integrated with language arts and they're teaching science and English integrated with language arts. So the first thing you'll see is the theme, the essential question, the content area standards. So here are California social study standards, NGSS standards in science. And then you have in this particular case, it's common core standards for language arts. Here's writing, here's reading. We use the, the latter. Um, standards one and 10 are non-negotiable. We always teach them in reading. These are the standards that we're um, complementing or that are our guided reading um, teaching points. Then you have the same in Spanish, writing standards, the bucket, if you will, opinion, narrative, or informative, what we call the bucket fillers, and then the reading standards. And from here we develop our units. So I'm sharing you with you a second grade um, unit. This is um, civics integrated with social studies and the first page of the assessment packet, where as you see, we are assessing oracy um, because that's what we're starting with. And then finally, a day-to-day -day bi-literacy learning plan where 
We use our standards and our outcomes. We know what the assessment is going to be and we actually plan all of our instruction. So to conclude, I've presented the ideas of teaching for biliteracy using this juxtaposition between the monolingual and the multilingual perspective. And I just like to point out, you can also think of it as fixed versus growth mindset. And to conclude, we're going to take this wonderful utterance by a student who says to the question, ¿Qué vas a hacer este fin de semana? What are you going to do this coming weekend? Voy a una party con mi brother. The monolingual perspective would say, oh my goodness, another student who can't speak Spanish well. This student is low in both languages. Shouldn't be in a two-way immersion or dual language program because this kid's confused. Let's put them in a monolingual, all English classroom, right? Because they're gonna get confused, but more confused if we teach them to learn to read and write in both languages. What's the multilingual perspective pushback, right? What do we say back to that? The first thing we say is, wait a minute, this student has linguistic resources in both languages. There is nothing wrong with this statement. It is simply bilingual. It is conjugated correctly, but it's bilingual. This student's first language is bilingual, and this student is translanguaging. Um, she reflects her multilingual community. This is how her home is organized. I'm sure mom says, dile a tu brother que dinner's ready. The student should be in a dual language or bilingual classroom uses you as Spanish and would really thrive and benefit from the bridge. Now, the beauty of the multilingual perspective is that you do not have to be bilingual to employ it, but you do have to have the mindset. And so I wanted to um, 